start now if you're ready, Heather. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you for inviting me today, Katie. That's really uh, great of you. Um, just a little bit about myself so everybody knows who I am. I'm the strategic lead for 3C Shared Services Building Control. Um, I'm a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Building, the Chartered Association of Building Engineers, and I'm also an associate of the Institute of Fire Engineering. Um, I am also a non-executive board director for our member organisation, Local Authority Building Control, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a short while. So um, we're a council partnership of three councils. So that's Cambridge City, South Cambridgeshire District Council and Huntingdonshire District Council. Um, we've been in operation since 2015. We have a team of around 35 technical support officers and surveyors. Um, very professional, highly experienced and greatly valued by service users. We uh, operate on continual feedback on our service provision. So for um, every project that we deal with on completion, we would ask for feedback from homeowners so that uh, we know how we've uh, done. Um, we have a reputation of an award winning team that often goes the extra mile. And we are uh, currently waiting results of finalists and the IEZ awards for efficiency and effectiveness, which we'll know in September whether we've run, won uh, bronze, silver or gold. So that's really good news. Um, just a, a little bit to say that the team at 3CBC also include um, street naming and numbering and construction site monitoring, which is another really important area. Um, just a little bit more on local authority building control, the member organisation. Uh, so the member organisation is for local authorities. It's not the staff who work in building control. It's the local authorities themselves. It was established in England and Wales um, with assistance from the LGA. Um, and that came about when in, in competition was introduced. Um, and I'll talk about our competition in a little while. So it brings together all the building control teams across the country, England and Wales. Um, although Wales has devolved regulations, there's 320 plus authorities and that's 3,700 building control professionals. Um, we provide national guidance and consistency, technical training and policy guidance. And we are the industry voice for public service building control. Um, it does exclude Scotland and Ireland, although we are in um, um, discussions with them. Uh, interestingly, Scotland has a different system, which is based on warrants for buildings, um, and they don't have competition similar to us. Um, OK, so what does local authority building control mean? Um, our main functions are public safety, consumer protection, safety at sports ground um, and enforcement. We uh, act on dangerous structures, so we're available uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, um, and we advise the fire and rescue service on safe entry in um, buildings that are unfortunately um, have issues with them. We make buildings safe um, and we also deal with demolitions. Um, we also control disabled adaptations um, and that has to come to local authority building control. And we process notifications. So uh, I think someone mentioned earlier about plumbers signing off their own work. You also get um, electrical um, companies that do the same and they can use what's known as a competent person scheme. Um, but as part of that, they are required to notify um, the local authority and we are required to keep a register. Um, and that also goes for initial notices. And I'll talk a little bit more about them in a short while. We do a lot of what we call non-compliance interventions. So as we um, plan check, we are always checking for compliance with the regulations. And if we find something that is not non-compliant, then we will speak to the agents. And that's termed as a non-compliance intervention. Um, we also do that whilst we're on site. So during the build process, we will undertake inspections and we will check and see um, whether it demonstrates compliance. And if not, we raise it and then we move forward with a solution. 
Um, some study was uh, some some figures for, for you for that. A study was done by the University of Wolverhampton in 2017, and the economic value of public service building control interventions is estimated at 1.85 billion per annum. So that's not an inconsiderable amount of um, of money. Okay. Um, so is there only local authority building control? No, I think we have talked about that. The um, legislation by government allows commute consumer choice for the provision of building control. Um, so what does that mean? It means you can either use your local council or you can use an approved inspector um, and it's your choice. Our role is to check the building regulations as far as reasonable are being complied with. Um, and the person carrying out the work, usually the building owner, has to make an application to either the local authority or an approved inspector to engage the building control service. Approved inspectors are companies um, that can provide an alternative to obtaining building regulations approval from us, from the local authority. Um, they also help developers, designers, contractors uh, to uh, achieve compliance. There are almost 100 operating throughout England and Wales, but every project has to be notified to the local authority and we again have to have to maintain a register and that's what's known as an initial notice. Um, an approved inspector needs your written authorization uh, to submit an application or in the case of volume housing that should be through the builder or developer. So they need permission to act as the building control body on the project. Once formally appointed, then they notify us. And unfortunately, we have no further involvement in, in those um, cases. Uh, you cannot commence your work on a project until the initial notice has been accepted or until five working days has passed. Uh, okay, so the duty, what do we do? <laughs> so we provide an independent third party assessment of building regulations compliance. Um, as I talked about, we check plans. So there are two routes, you can submit an application with plans and we will check them for compliance and give feedback. Um, or you can do a building notice, which is a notification. Uh, we also undertake site inspections, um, and that's a really valuable point of the service. So if you are appointing building control, you do need to make sure that you are aware of the number of site inspections that will be undertaken for you on your project. Uh, there are more than one way of achieving compliance. Um, it's not a guarantee. We don't guarantee work and we're not a clerk of works. We're not on site um, all of the time. I think someone mentioned earlier that they operate as a clerk of works. Um, uh, and I do think that role is coming back into the industry now. Um, and indeed we are hoping to offer that ourselves. So you will be able to obtain clerk of works from 3C building control. Um, the owner and occupier of the property or building is ultimately responsible for complying with the relevant regulations. Quite often people forget that um, at the end of the day, the compliance is down to the owner and occupier. Um, and they also need to make sure they have any other necessary statu statutory permissions. Um, planning was mentioned earlier. So. The regulations themselves are very brief. They just detail the requirement for compliance, um, but they're supported by various documents called approved documents, um, British standards and various other periodicals as well. Um, the issue with guidance is that it is open to interpretation and there is more than one way of demonstrating compliance, as I mentioned earlier. Um, in 2017, following Grenville, there was an independent review of building regulations. Um, and some of the comments that Dame Judith Hackett, who was appointed to undertake the review, said was the ability for duty holders to choose their own regulator must stop and regulators must be able to enforce as regulators. Um, and that's something that we'll talk about in a little while. Industry practices will force um, a change on duty holders. So duty holders will have to go through three gateways and we are now seeing that come into practice. So from um, August 2021, gateway one will come into force, which requires a fire safety statement to be submitted at planning submission stage. And they will 
at, as part of that, the um, applicant will have to address issues with fire safety. Uh, the insurers as well to the construction industry are forcing developers and contractors to work differently. Uh, there is some unintended consequences of that, and we will talk about that in a short while as well. Um, and another thing that was raised, which is really valid and important, was the competence, experience and capability and the requirement for that to be explicit across the industry. Um, I think that brings me to the external wall system forms. I think that's been raised earlier as well. Um, this was brought in in November 2019, and it was intended to reassure mortgage lenders that buildings over 80 metres were safe. So it was a system to assess the buildings. Um, and then in January 20, further advice notes uh, were introduced, but that resulted in mortgage lenders beginning to insist on them for buildings under 18 metres as well. So there was an unintended consequence of that. Um, so new guidelines came out in November uh, in relation to the use of external wall um, systems forms, EWS1 forms, um, along with some funding so that the RIS, RICS had funding to train 2,000 new assessors. One of the problem that the industry had was um, that there wasn't enough qualified assessors and therefore people were having to wait for their buildings to be assessed. Um, and the other issue we had was with insurance. So we asked um, uh, if we could uh, become assessors. Um, local authority building control are able to complete the forms, but unfortunately the um, insurance industry would not support that. Um, so, and there's now a central portal for the forms as well, um, and that's at the buildingsafetyportal.co.uk. So you have the ability to search by postcode, you can view and download the form free of charge. We did hear of instances where people were being asked to pay for uh, copies of the forms or were not um, able to access them, but the government recognised that and changed it. So we do have now an open central portal where you can access your forms. Um, and I think, I think again was mentioned was the, that the Housing Secretary, Robert Jenrick, has said that um, there will be exemptions from leaseholders on low to medium blocks for the requirement, and that's following new safety advice um, from fire safety experts, but we need to see what happens and how that comes about. Okay, so what are local authority building control doing to help? So nationally, we are members of the post Grenville expert panels. We're members of the working groups established as part of Dame Judith Hackett's review of the building regulations and fire safety. We're members of the joint regulators group, um, expert group advising government on the implementation of building a safer future. And we work with organisations such as um, the LGA, the local government association. So um, the, the regulators group uh, is made up of LABC, National Fire Chiefs Council, LGA, and the Health and Safety, HSE. So uh, what are we doing locally? We've established accredited qualifications for building control in levels four, five, and six. It qualifies for the apprentice levy funding. So this is to help with the recruitment challenge and to ensure that people are competent. Um, where resourcing competence is shared, shared between local authorities within regions. Uh, we are undertaking team reviews to make sure that the building control teams are fit. Um, and we have a national quality management system, which is accredited and externally audited. Um, so uh, again, I think reference was uh, early, made earlier to the building safety bill and where we are now. So we're still going through ongoing changes to legislation and guidance. So approved document B is changing um, and regulation seven. The draft building safety bill was um, published in 2020 um, and the uh, pre-legislative scrutiny of that was uh, response was published in November 2020. So the first reading of the building safety bill was published on the 1st of July 2021. Uh, second reading was on the 21st of July 2021. So we're still going through and assessing that to see the implications it will have on our profession. Um, part three is all about the Building Act and the changes. 
um, that will come in. It will take, we anticipate, around two years to implement because there's a lot of secondary legislation that's now required. The important part of this is the registration of the profession. So building control bodies will only be able to carry out certain functions if you have a registered building control surveyor. The registration of building control will be at all levels. Um, to do plan checks and site inspection, you will need to be registered and all will have to be approved by the building control regulator. So the building safety regulator is the HSE. So, um, so there's a change to the regime moving forward um, and will hopefully address um, any concerns people have with competency. Um, other changes from the original draft bill was the um, definition of higher risk buildings. So the bill now makes it clear what the definition is of the high rise residential buildings. So it's buildings that are at least 18 meters in height or have at least seven stories and have at least two residential units uh, and care homes and hospitals are also included. Uh, I think the important point here is um, what was uh, mentioned earlier was about a two tier system. We don't want a two tier system. You know, we want all buildings to be safe. Um, there is going to be an uh, introduction of a new levy which will target developers. Um, so uh, when they're seeking building control approval, um, there, as I've mentioned, there'll be a registered building inspector, so uh, we will have to be registered, which will uh, show our competency, um, and there'll be a registration and certification um, for a, a new register of higher risk buildings, um, so that we can we know where all those buildings are. This amends the Building Act for England, um, and. Uh, obviously, as I said, will take probably around two years to come in to full being. So, um, yeah, plan for transition. So we will be transitioning over the next two years. Uh, planning Gateway 1 is the first part of that with the new um, requirement from August. Um, the proposed legislation enables the building safety regulator, so that's the health and safety, to call on the advice and support of local authorities and fire risk, fire and rescue um, service when taking decisions on in-scope buildings. Um, effectively, these will be in what's known as a multidisciplinary team approach, so we will be working together um, with, to make sure that the buildings are as safe as possible moving forward. Um, so I just want to touch briefly on competence. We've talked about the work that LABC are doing on competence. Competence is not just about knowledge and skills. It's about behaviours and experience, what experience you have in working on high rise, etc. Um, and it needs to be validated by an independent certification body. OK, uh, I just mentioned the new homes ombudsman again, that was mentioned this morning. So a lot, a lot of the things I've got in, in my presentation have been mentioned, which is great. Um, we talked um, so currently quality construction in homes is supported through um, a consumer code for house builders and other codes of practice. Um, the new arrangements will hopefully introduce a new single home, new homes code and a new home om, ombudsman. All builders and developers of new homes will be required to sign up. Home buyers will have the right to complain to the ombudsman um, and the intention is to have that in place later this year, although we have heard this for, uh, for quite a while. Um, so. I think if again, if you've got issues, um, there are uh, other avenues you might try with trading standards. But the first thing you need to do is make sure you follow any kind of complaints procedure of the builders and developers um, and and then move through. But I, the the idea is the new home om ombudsman will have statutory powers and that may include issuing fine and deregistering developers. So that would be helpful. Uh, so 3CBC, what are we doing? So we have got a quality management system, which is ISO 9001-2015. That's for our standards and the way that we operate. Um, we are looking at competence of the team. We have five apprentices in our team of 35 um, at various stages. Um, and we have two more starting us in September, and they will also go through the apprentice scheme. 
Uh, we've introduced virtual weekly technical meetings with the Fire and Rescue Service. We've got Wayne joining us soon, um, and that's been re really positive. We talk about technical issues across all of the three councils that we operate um, in, and that's now been expanded, and we include colleagues from planning. So once a month, we meet with colleagues from planning as well. Um, and the idea is that we uh, start those conversations at the, at the earliest point of the process. Um, we're planning a series of virtual webinars um, for Autumn 21 for householders and communities to learn more about building control and what they need to know and some of the pitfalls. Um, and we're also doing building uh, control awareness sessions. So we have developed um, a, a um, programme of 15 sessions. Uh, we started that this year as a trial and we went from five to, I think that at the end there was 46 attendees on, uh, on that, those sessions, which were uh, just an hour a week, but again, to raise awareness. So we're going to develop that for um, uh, uh, developers or agents or anybody who's interested in the construction industry. Um, Heather, oh, sorry. I think I'm going to, can I ask you to wrap up because I'd like the panel oh. to be able to ask questions if that's okay. okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. So I've got just a couple more points. So thermal, um, we've got a thermal imaging camera. So we have a scheme um, where we're going to address the performance gap, but we're very um, conscious that we also need to not forget energy in all of this and, and our aspirations. Um, we're looking at a GIS system that will provide public access with data. So you will be able to click on your own um, property and get all of the data that we hold in building control. So, um, and the fire and rescue service are going to be part of that as well and we have a joint campaign with the fire and rescue service on sprinklers and wayne's going to talk about that so um i think that's it uh that's it thank you that's thank it. You, brilliant brilliant a description of all the many things you do to me would you like to come in and then afterwards um heather katie and sam um I think, I mean, I'm familiar with the work that um, Heather's team does, and I must congratulate them on, you know, continuing to carry out some really good work. I just wish that all the developers would use them um, so that we can have the quality buildings, really, frankly. <laughs> um, but let me leave the floor to, um, you know, to those who perhaps have um, questions that they would like to ask. Heather Williams or Sam? Yeah. Hi, Heather. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, obviously, those of us that are, sit on the in the council are very familiar with, with 3C. And, and as Toomey says, um, you know, you, you are award winning and it would be great to see more people using you. Um, I, I did wonder whether we've had a bit of a discussion earlier on about sort of um, deregulization and, and regularization. Just if you've got any thoughts on that of what you think would be the right right way forward. Um, is that something that you think would be, is, is it necessary to create um, regulation in, in your view? Obviously, everybody's got their own personal opinion. <laughs> um, so uh, my personal opinion is um, that I think uh, com competition brought some good points because it does make us much more customer focused. Um, you know, and aware of, of listening to people. So I think that's a really positive point of, of um, competition. I think um, for further discussions about whether it's right or wrong to still have a, a local authority and, a, and private companies, I think that there's, there's differences when I, and the differences are effectively um, we, we don't make a profit. Obviously, we're a, a, a local authority um, department so therefore um you know we work within the legislation that we we um we have to operate within which means we don't make a profit um we are very transparent in what we do so we're very transparent in the number of inspections that we undertake and the advice that you can get from us um, we also try as much as possible to advise people at the earliest opportunity um, of what we can and can't do because that's very difficult i think there was a, a little bit of a misunderstanding of what the building control role is um, but I think there's opportunities there to, to um, look at maybe the clerk of works. Um, I think it's a difficult one to talk about deregulation and regulation <laughs> um, um, because 
uh, you know, in an ideal world, you would have regulation. Um, but I understand, you know, that sometimes that uh, can have more more uh, constraint and more financial burden. So um, it's a difficult one to answer. Hope that's Thank okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sam, do you want to come in or Katie Porra? Hi, I'm not sure if sounds, I don't want to jump ahead of Sam, but I'll, I'll happily quickly say, yeah, I mean, I think it's good to hear that there is some change coming, Heather. That's uh, welcome. And obviously, we're very happy to have your team on board. I mean, it's almost, it's almost tempting to think we could do some kind of not quite preferred supplier, but a list of surveyors that we work with that we're happy with. But I'm guessing, again, there are implications for that in terms of us condoning something that, you know, without having to have a new set of regulations to guide that. Um, yeah, it, it is this issue really for me about if firms can employ their own person, if there's no proper regulation, it's really difficult to be happy that particularly on the big sites, things are being signed off properly. So it's good to know we've got you offering the service. And I suppose one of the things we could look at as well as how we potentially promote that, as you say, it's not profit making, you know, it goes back into the council, it, you know, it goes to fund things for residents. So, yes, no, it's really, really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Heather, can I just ask, do you, why do you think people choose to go with other suppliers of this service? It, but if you're non-profit making, then presumably you're extremely price competitive. Yeah. So a, a cynical view would be that they go elsewhere because they think they'll get an easier ride. But I don't know if my cynicism is misplaced on this occasion or not. What, what's your sense about why people go elsewhere? Um, I think sometimes um, people are unaware. So um, they may not have known that the decision um, to use a, a private company rather than um, a local authority has been made. Sometimes that's, um, you know, maybe done by um, a particular contractor um, and, and the house owner themselves are not aware. So we do try and sort of educate people about the choice because there is still a choice, you know, that, that's that's the idea. Government brought that choice in. Um, and then I think there are some that definitely use us. So we will get around 40% because we are a local authority and they know that we're independent. So they will come to us anyway. Um, and I think there is something about, I think someone mentioned earlier about when you buy a car, um, you probably have more checks. Um, and it's aware, it's raising awareness because the choice should be made on a like for like service so that, you know, you're getting the same level of service and the same independence. Um, so I think it's more about being very transparent on what you get when you make that choice. Um, so, uh, I mean, personally, in an ideal world, I would like to say you could, should only use local authority building control. Um, but, you know, I, um, uh, there is choice, as we say, and that, that's, that's, in, that's already there. So whether that will change, I don't know. So. And if there was one group that you'd really want to get your message out to about your service to win more business, who would you be targeting? Um, I think we uh, it, it does tend to be um, you usually get major house build, builders that tend to uh, not use local authority. Not, not always, not always. That's, I can't say that's for everyone, but there are major house builders who do uh, quantity across all of the country nationally. And they may have their choices for that, because obviously if they're a national company, then they could, um, uh, if they use one company that also works nationally, then they can work across the whole country. So that might be, that might help or that might have informed their decision making. Um, so yes, probably the major house holders. Thank you. We're going to wrap up this session because we've got the fire officer. I, I just want to make one comment that you, you mentioned about a fire statement being part of the uh, coming to planning. I can't wait for that. I really think it, it can't come too soon. Thank you very much, Heather.